Good morning. morning. Nice to see you. I'm sorry it's a bit chilly. The aircon system has decided that it doesn't want to. It's not because it was cold, it's because the serviceman found a fault a week ago and he's waiting for parts. So of course we then have the coldest weekend that we've had for a long time. So sorry about that, just keep your outer outer clothes on and uh, we'll try and be a bit active. Have to get you dancing when we're singing to increase your metabolic rate. Um, so welcome, nice to be together, nice to see the G's, they've disappeared, they're there, there's the G's there, nice to have them back, um, and uh, I think we're going to sing a song yes. about being the time to worship, is yeah. that right? So hopefully that will get everyone a bit warmed okay. up. <laughs> Thank Happy you. Happy Mother's Day by the way to all mothers. Let's stand and sing together and worship. let us pray. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, so that we may truly love you and worthily praise your holy name through our Saviour Jesus Christ. Amen. (coughs) Would you like to be seated? St. Paul wrote, We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. 
So we come to confess our sins with sincere and true hearts. We pray, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbour in thought, word and deed, through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy on you, pardon you and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we're going to stand now for the peace. May the peace of Christ be always with you. So let's greet one another as we say peace be with you. Tony's. Tony, we, we sang happy birthday to it at 8 o'clock, but we can do it again with a different congregation. I think everybody else is either not here or at a different congregation. Are there any birthdays for this week? Where is Tony? Is Tony? <laughs> Tony, it seems to be all yours, and we sang happy birthday to you last time. This time we'll sing birthday greetings to you. <laughs> birthday greetings today. May God bless you, we pray. Live for Jesus, dear Tony. May he guide you each day. So, do we have words of encouragement of what God's been up to, how he's been interacting with you, how he's answered your prayers? What do you want to share with us? And let's have Sarah. Do you want the step? Do I want to what? The step? No, I don't know. I don't know if been here before. Oh. Hi. Um, so a very long time ago, Anne gave us a testimony about how she lost her glasses. And she prayed, and God showed her where they were. And I lose things constantly. So I kind of try not to pray all the time because I feel like that would be... <laughs> like that. I don't want that to be my only prayer that God helps me find things that I'm constantly losing. But last weekend, Asher lost his phone and we had turned the house upside down to find this um, phone that he'd only just got. And so I suddenly thought... I know what I need to do, I need to pray and I prayed and I went into Asher's bedroom and I saw his chair and I thought I'm just going to check the chair, I know he's checked the chair, so I lifted the cushions up and it wasn't there and I decided I'd just have a little feel around the cushions and there it was it had fallen down inside the cushion through a hole and it was kind of hidden we wouldn't ever feel it unless you actually just tried to do it and so thank you Lord for for guiding me to to that and to Anne for your previous testimony about um, finding things so thank you Amen, wonderful Anne, and Helen. And I see that ear. Was that a, I want to come up and give a test? No? Just an itchy ear. We went to the Regan conference for uh, two days last week. Well, three days, bits of. And it was wonderful. Yes, it was. Um, and, and I just want to say that I went to a prophecy workshop and it was so encouraging to be invited to just wait on God for words to encourage other people and to find that five that I gave hit the mark. 
Mm. And it was so, so wonderful to see people's response and how much it was helping them. So thank you, Lord. So don't everybody line up, just, uh, just a few, uh, with uh, Anne after the service for prophecy. <laughs> um, my name's Helen, for those of you who don't know, and I went to the same conference, and I was just thrilled at one, how one of the speakers opened up the first prayer that we pray on, uh, in church every Sunday, Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. And it just suddenly came alive to me, and I recognized that, well, that God's amazing, that he can see inside my heart. He knows everything about me. He knows the depths and the, every little corner of my heart that I think nobody sees. But it kind of just reinforced to me, God sees me. He knows me. He loves me. And that's so for every one of you. And that's something to celebrate. Good morning. Uh, my name's Michael. So I went to the same conference and same workshop as Anne. I thought being prophetic is for someone like Anne, you know, with, a, with lots of studies and extremely holy and all of that. And, and um, yeah, it was, it was quite... Surprise to you, because we went to the same workshop, and I thought, surely you can't put God in a little, you know, an hour and a half slot and make him do stuff. But surprisingly, uh, very simple steps that we followed, and we just say, just give it a go. If it's wrong, it's fine. And always test what you can sort of um, visualize or see and how you feel. And it's amazing that even for me, I felt like I've managed to um, to speak into someone's life and and he confirmed afterwards during dinner to say, yep, that was sort of spot on. I was like, thank you, God. So, oh, yeah. Wonderful. Well, I get the sermon to tell you about how wonderful. <laughs> uh, going on from what Helen was saying, but it really was uh, an excellent conference. Um, those who didn't come, you missed something very special. It was probably one of the better conferences I've been to. And... Um, uh, that's really heartening because um, it's, it, the, the, the key speaker is the head of City to City, who are the group who are working with us in the next year to, uh, to strengthen and revitalise the parish. And uh, if just one speaker was having such an impact, it, it bodes well for the input of City to City with us. Um, Andrew uh, Bruce Brand, our People's Warden, also went and I said, did you, how did you get on with it? And he said, well, I haven't been able to stop talking to Leslie about it since I got home. So I, I think he thought it was pretty good. Okay, well, we've got things to praise God for. What we've heard, we've got things to praise God for that are in your hearts that you haven't said, but he knows them because he knows your hearts. And we're going to get a chance now to express that as we sing. Thank you. Stand and sing together.
of your splendor on the corner of my eye the most beautiful thing I've ever seen it was like a flash of lightning reflected off the sky and I know I'll never be the same show me your glory shine down your presence I want to see your face show me your glory Majesty shines about you I can't go on without you this stage the children are going out to their program. Thank you, Wendy and others who are leading them. Uh, Wendy and Sume and perhaps some others. So that's both children and youth, I think. Is that right, Wendy? No? <laughs> so Father, we pray as they go that you would be with them, that there would be good engagement, good learning, and um, that you would bring them back rejoicing to us. Amen. Helen, would you like to bring the readings, please? <coughs> would you read the whole thing through that gap? We start our readings today uh, with Acts chapter 1, starting at verse 15. And you'll find that in your Bibles, the Pew Bibles, on page 1057, if you'd like to follow along with me. 1057. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through the mouth of David, concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of our number and shared in this ministry. With a reward he got for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that field in their language Akeldama, that is, the field of blood. For, Pete, for, said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one let to dwell in it, and may another take his place of leadership. 
Therefore, it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us through the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these men must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they proposed two men, Joseph, called Barsabbas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over this apostolic ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs. Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the 11, disciples, the 11 apostles. Then we go to the first letter that we have from John, uh, page 1196 in your pew Bible. And we're starting at chapter 5, verse 9. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who testifies, because the Spirit is the truth. For there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. We accept man's testimony, but God's testimony is greater because it is the testimony of God, which he has given about his Son. Anyone who believes in the Son of God has this testimony in his heart. Anyone who does not believe God has made, has made God out to be a liar because he has not believed the testimony God has given about his son. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life and this life is in his son. He who has the son has life. He who does not have the son of God does not have life. I write these things to you to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, so that you may know that you have eternal life. Amen. Would you stand for the gospel? The Holy Gospel according to John, chapter 17, beginning at verse 6. Praise and glory to God. We're on page 1049, and it is Jesus who is speaking. I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that we may be one, they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by the name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, so that scripture would be fulfilled. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, 
but that you protect them from the evil one. They are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. This is the Gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ the Word. May the words of my mouth and the thoughts of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, you know the progression. It goes Good Friday, Easter, Ascension, Pentecost. The crucifixion, the resurrection, the ascension, and the coming of the Holy Spirit. After the resurrection, Jesus remained for 40 days, during which time he appeared to Peter, to some other apostles, and even at one time to 500 people at the same time. At the end of that period, he instructed his his disciples to wait for the empowering of the Holy Spirit. He commissioned them to evangelize, and then he ascended from their sight to be enthroned at the right hand of God the Father. Forty days after Easter was Ascension. Forty days after Easter was last Thursday. And then we celebrated Ascension. Ten days after Ascension is Pentecost, which will be next Sunday. But you know, for the disciples, after Jesus had left them, there was a matter they needed to deal with. Jesus had appointed twelve apostles, but Judas had betrayed Jesus and was now dead. The number of apostles needed to be restored. Jesus had said that they were to be his witnesses to the world. And these were those who had been with him all through his ministry, from the baptism right through to the crucifixion and witnesses of the resurrection. In that gospel passage we heard, which is part of Jesus' prayer after the Last Supper, he said of the apostles that he had given revelation to them and they had believed him. They had believed with certainty that he was sent by God. And it was important that there were 12 leaders re-established because here was a group which would be saying it was the righteous remnant. And if they were going to be this remnant of Israel and trying to bring Israel to repentance and permeate it with God's glory, then in the thinking of that day it had both to be by proclamation and in symbolism, 12 tribes, 12 apostles. In just the same way, the Qumran community had 12 leaders. Jesus himself said the 12 disciples would rule a kingdom and they would sit on thrones and judge the 12 tribes of Israel. So they needed to choose one who had been among them of this next ring of disciples outside the 12 from the beginning, from Jesus' baptism right through to the Ascension. So somewhere between Ascension and Pentecost, Peter urged this group of believers to appoint a replacement. Judas had betrayed Jesus for money. He is now dead. And Peter not only finds reference to Judas' betrayal in the Psalms, but also to the prescription of appointing another one in his stead. So he quoted from Psalm 69, May their place be deserted. Let there be no one to dwell in their tents. For they persecute those you wound and talk about the pain of those you hurt. Charge them with crime upon crime. Do not let them share in your salvation. May they be blotted out of the book of life and not be listed with the righteous. And then from Psalm 102. Wicked and deceitful men have opened their mouths against me. They have spoken against me with lying tongues. With words of hatred they surround me, they attack me without cause. In return for my friendship they accuse me, they repay me evil for good and hatred for my friendship. May his days be few, may another take his place of leadership. So the disciples chose two of their number who fitted the parameters that had been described and then they prayed for the Lord to make a selection between the two. But do you notice what they prayed? They said, you know everyone's heart. Now they're meaning, of course, that 
God should make the selection of the one who is best suited to this role of apostle. But you know everyone's heart in Greek is a single word. It's cardia nostes. Cardia, heart, nostes, knowing. He knows our hearts. That's what it's saying. God, you know our hearts. This is what Helen was referring to earlier on in, in, in her excitement over the conference. Do you wonder if God understands you? The answer is yes. He knows your heart. He is the heart knower. It's a name the disciples gave God. And you may fear that he knows your heart, or you may take comfort that he knows your heart. He knows you, and because he loves you, you can take comfort. So let's for a moment consider Judas. He's mentioned in both the Gospel and in the Epistle reading, in the, 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 the book of Acts. Judas was a follower of Jesus, and yet in the end he betrayed him. Now there's quite a fashion for excusing him, for coming up with reasons that he had very good intentions and it just all went wrong, got a bit confused, but that's not how his fellow disciples saw it. And while some people would then jump to the conclusion that there was a vindictive attitude, remember that they were taught, before we were taught, to forgive, and that they've taught us to forgive, and surely if they're teaching us that, they would also be aware of the need to forgive Judas. Jesus hinted that someone would betray him. The scriptures had warned him of this, that he would be betrayed by someone close to him. And indeed, he quoted Psalm 41 at the very time he was saying who it was in the Last Supper. Even my close friend whom I trusted, he who shared my bread has lifted up his heel against me. And then he indicated it was Judas. Now, Jesus had responded to the call to follow Jesus. He'd gone out on short-term missions and pairs. It would have been quite difficult, perhaps, having him as your pair, paired-up partner on short-term mission, but presumably miracles were worked through him as well. But something was wrong. And we get the first inkling in what we are given in the Gospel account, because, of course, a lot else happened we didn't hear any detail of, but the first inkling we get is that occasion when Mary was pouring out the jar of anointing oil to honour Jesus. And Judas sourly accused her of waste and said it would have been better for the oil to have been sold and the money given to the poor. Mary had just received her brother back from the tomb after he'd been dead for four days. Mary understood that Jesus was God in person. And she was giving him the very best thing that she had. But Judas' heart was not in tune with that sort of devotion. He was not honouring Jesus extravagantly. But rather John tells us that Judas was a thief. And he'd been entrusted with a money bag for the disciples and he used to take money from it. He wanted the proceeds of the sale of anointing oil to be in the money bag where he could get it. Here then is a persistent sin indulged in right under Jesus' nose. That's pretty blatant. But you know, even at the Last Supper, at that late stage, Jesus was still reaching out to him, still offering him opportunity. When he had said that one would betray him, John asked him quietly, who is it? And he told John, it is the man to whom I give the piece of bread. Then he dipped it and gave it to Judas. Now what we don't necessarily understand is that it was the custom that the president, the, the father of the household, the president of the feast, gave that first piece of bread to the person he wanted to honour. And he gave it to Judas. He honoured him who was plotting to betray him, knowing that he was plotting to betray him. And was that not a call to him? Turn back from what you're about to do, although I know that you are actually going to do it. It was to no avail. Judas was determined on his course of action and he left the gathering straight after receiving the piece of bread. 
And it's soon after that that Jesus prayed the prayer that we heard as the gospel reading and said, while I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. The one doomed to destruction is literally, in the Greek, the son of perdition. The NIV Bible commentary says about that, the language does not imply that Judas was a helpless victim who was destined to petition, petition against his will. Rather, it implies that having made his decision, he passed the point of no return, and by doing so, he carried out what the scriptures had indicated would happen. So in him, we see a man following the form of, of Jesus' disciple, but not his heart. And we do well to take care that our following of Jesus is more than just form, more than just going to church. But it has a substance of heart engagement and loyalty to Jesus. There needs to be a change of heart within us, which Jesus calls being born again. It is new life into the old shell, and that, it seems, was lacking in Judas. And that brings me then to the question of how can we be sure that we are saved and that we will stay saved? And John addresses that in the first letter that we heard read, his first letter. He said that he wrote, so that we may know we have eternal life. And he wrote of the evidence for that. Now, you need to realise that this is the fifth chapter of this letter. It wasn't written in chapters, of course, but there's been a rather long discussion leading up to this point, and we're getting little segments of it, which makes it rather hard to follow the thrust of the argument. But at this point, he's saying, look, even God gives evidence that Jesus is the Christ. And he makes reference to the water and the blood. And we think, what is he talking about? And commentators say, what is he talking about? But the majority view seems to be that the water is referring to Jesus' baptism and the blood is referring to his death on the cross. That at baptism and before the crucifixion, on both occasions, God spoke audibly. The people heard God speak. Before the baptism, said, this is my son, with whom I'm well pleased. And again, before the crucifixion, there was uh, an audible response of God about uh, glorifying Jesus. But we also have the testimony of God through the witness of the Holy Spirit in our own hearts. If we are Christians, we are given the inner witness of truth and the reality of these events by the Holy Spirit. That's what Paul meant when he said in Acts 4 that the Holy Spirit is witness to the resurrection and the exhortation of Jesus. The Spirit within us says, yes, this is true. He gives us that assurance. He gives us the ability to believe what otherwise we'd say, well, I don't know if this is true or not. That's why you are believing, if you are. In verse 11, John in his letter continues by explaining the testimony, it is that God has given us eternal life and that life is in his Son. If you have Jesus, you have life. If you do not have Jesus, he says, you do not have life. That Jesus himself is life and he is eternal life. John says, if you believe the testimony of God, if you trust in Jesus as the Son of God, the one able to save you, you have eternal life. So will we follow truly? Are we committed? On our own, the answer is no. We won't do it. Jesus said in John 15, If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit Apart from me, you can do nothing. It's not the only place he said that. Apart from him, we can do nothing. So where does our confidence come from that we can follow him? Well, if a man remains in me, he will bear much fruit. In the prayer that we had in the gospel reading, we could summarize that prayer. And I say that because 
John, the Apostle John's thinking seems to be very spiral in nature. He keeps on repeating himself and restating the same thing, but then adding a little tweak to it. And then he goes around and he says it again. And for me, that messes with my, my, my thinking. I, I, <laughs> it needs to be straightened out and made linear. Uh, I complained about that when I was at Theological College. My lecturer smiled and said, well, I can't do much about changing John's thinking, but you just have to sort it out. So I've summarized what, what John actually prayed. That the, oh, sorry, that he reports Jesus is praying, that the disciples were given by God the Father to Jesus and Jesus revealed the Father to them. They had believed and obeyed his word and they believed that Jesus came from God. He prayed for the Father to protect them from the evil one by the power of God's name and he prayed that God would sanctify them by God's word, which is truth. So Jesus is praying for the disciples that they be protected. He's protected them so far, he's about to be crucified, so he's saying, Father, you protect them from the power of the evil one. And surely he prays the same way for us. We need that. If he thought it was necessary for his disciples during his earthly ministry, would he not think it's necessary for us during this continued ministry time? And in Hebrews 7 we read that Jesus is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Jesus lives now in heaven to intercede for us. He's praying for us at this moment. He's praying for you right now. And he knows your heart. And he's praying for you. In John chapter 10, in the Good Shepherd passage, he said, I give my sheep eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of the Father's hand. So we are safe in God's hands, and Jesus is praying for us, for our protection, and for all the other needs in our lives. Now let's go back to that word, this cardia nostes, God being the heart knower. He knows my heart. He knows your heart, each one of us. He knows the good things in your heart. And there are some good things in your heart. And he knows the bad things in your heart. And there are some bad things in your heart. And there are some things which are good, but they've got too much importance to you. So they become disordered. They're not bad in themselves. They've just, they need to be under God, but they've got over God. This was a significant part of the teaching we heard at this conference. And it suddenly made sense to me of something from 31 years ago. Helen and I were looking to buy a house. We'd looked at many houses and we found a house that we thought was right, and we were praying about it, and we thought we had guidance to buy that house. We thought we had 13 points of guidance, which I said at the time seems a bit strange, it's too much. I didn't need that much guidance to buy this house. We'd been looking for some time, about nine months, we knew the market very well, we made a fair offer, we had private access before it went on the market. And the day it did go on, to, so we made an offer on the Thursday, on the Friday it went onto the market, and on Friday morning in my prayer time, I just sensed Jesus say to me, what's more important, me or the house? I said, well, you are, of course, Lord. Oh, I just wondered. And I thought, ooh, that, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> and that afternoon I learnt that somebody else had put in a higher offer and it had been accepted. And the real estate agent said, you, you haven't got the house. And I thought, well, I've got so much guidance about buying that house, obviously this offer will fall through and we will get the house, so we'll just wait for that offer to fall through. And the real estate agent said, it's not going to happen, it's unconditional, it's more than you offered, and there are two other unconditional offers after that one. You do not have the house. 
And we were really rocked. We really struggled because we thought we had clear guidance to buy the house and it hadn't worked out. And as I said at the time, I don't really care about the house, but I do care about the guidance because how can I trust anything else now? Well, we, we got over it. We loved God still. Very shortly after that, we were directed to another house which we, we bought and we were so glad we bought that house rather than the first one. It was a, a far better house for us. But I realised a couple of days ago in the conference, I suddenly realised that that was a disordered desire and God was putting it back into the right order. And he, he, I just had this little whisper of a thought, I did give you that guidance so we could sort out what was more important. So he led me up to the point, and Helen, he led us up to this point, looking for a house, thinking this was the house, and then took it away again. And now what are you going to, what's more important, me or the house? And we had to survive that, coming out and saying, yes, you really are more important. In other words, it was a deliberate I was going to say ploy, but ploy is not the right word. It was a deliberate strategy to reorder the desire for this house, and I think any house, to keep it less important than our love for God. And once it was less important, then it was okay. And he gave us a much nicer house, because actually that house would have been a disaster had we got it. It was run down, it needed a new roof, it needed painting inside and out, it was an you know, a really old lady who died and nothing had been done on the house for a long time and we had a baby due in about two months' time. <laughs> we would not have been able to cope with it. And he rescued us from it and gave us something better. He knows the desires of our hearts. We pray it each week and Helen highlighted it for you. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, so that we may truly love you and worthily praise your holy name through our Saviour Jesus Christ. To whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. That's the heart knower. That prayer goes back to at least the 10th century. It was originally in Latin, and the Latin would be more accurately translated, to whom all wishes are eloquent. Now think about that. Every wish that you have speaks fluently to God. That is really encouraging if they are good things in line with God's will. He knows them, he hears them. And it's a bit salutary if the wishes are not in line with God's will. So in that prayer, we ask that he would pour his Holy Spirit into our hearts to cleanse our hearts so that we can love him truly and praise him worthily. It comes back to dependence upon him. We need the Holy Spirit in us to cleanse our hearts and allow us to love him truly, putting things in their right order, you know, the, the, the small good things with small importance, the mediumly good things of medium importance, the really good things of great importance, and God with greatest importance, and praise him worthily. You, you may be quite uncomfortable about the idea that he knows your heart. Or you may be pleased about that idea. Or you may be both pleased and uncomfortable about that idea. <laughs> Last week we heard Jesus say, I call you, his, his disciples, my friends. Now, what is a friend? 
There is a quote from an authoress, Diana Craig, which says, A friend is one to whom one may pour out the contents of one's heart, chaff and grain together, knowing that gentle hands will take it and sift it. Keep what is worth keeping, and with a breath of kindness blow the rest away. Let me read that to you again. A friend is one to whom one may pour out the contents of one's heart, chaff and grain together, knowing that gentle hands will take it and sift it, keep what is worth keeping, and with a breath of kindness blow the rest away. Now if that can be true for the best of human friends, how much more is it true for the one who gave his life for us? Can we trust Jesus to act that way with our hearts so that we can pour out our hearts to him, the heart knower, and that he will keep that which is worth keeping and then just blow with his gentle spirit the chaff away so that he purifies our hearts and enables us to praise him and to love appropriately. I think we can. Craig. With it being Mother's Day, it seems appropriate to pray for the women in our congregation and in the world around us. So let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the women in our lives who bore us, raised us, and who continue to shape us. Thank you for the women in our church community who give so much of themselves and use their time and energy to care for us. They pray for us and they teach us. They put on morning teas, cater alpha dinners. They tend our grounds, arrange flowers, and do so much behind the scenes. Often this work isn't noticed until somebody doesn't do it. And just as often it receives no thanks. But without it, we know that we wouldn't have the sense of family that for many of us is what's precious about this place. Help us not to take them for granted and help us not to wear them out. Help us to remember to show them that we appreciate them. God, Mother's Day is a day of celebration, for a lot of us anyway. We make our calls, we send our cards, and we think of happy thoughts. But we know that for others, Mother's Day is difficult. And it's those people we intercede for today. There are many in our congregation whose mums are no longer alive. And for some, their mums died decades ago, and for others, this is the first Mother's Day where mum isn't around anymore. For those who are missing their mums, who continue to grieve for them, and who maybe wonder how they can keep going without them, we ask that you would be a balm. We ask that you would flood them with joy at the thought of their mothers, so much that there would be no place left for sorrow. We remember as well that there are women who don't have and maybe never had the relationship with their mothers that they'd hoped for. Some of us had amazing mums, and for others, Mother's Day is just a reminder that their mum was cruel or distant and judgmental. And perhaps Mother's Day opens old wounds uh, or adds salt to them. Please restore and heal those whose experiences with their mums has left scars. And we know that there are many women who long to be mothers, but have never had children. And we thank you for cases where this is something that they've come to be at peace with. But we also ask that for those for whom Mother's Day is just a stamp through the heart, that you would drench those women with your love and give them a sense of wholeness. This time of year, we always see ads uh, for chocolate, for flowers, they feature sweet little kids giving happy-looking women tokens of their love, and it's easy to forget that there are women for whom motherhood is difficult. 
and for whom a day of candy and cuddles every year doesn't make the rest of the days feel like less of a slog. It's easy too to forget that some mums just feel like they're waiting for signs of appreciation that never come. So we ask for your blessing on those mothers who are exhausted and drained, who wonder how they'll make it through the day and who feel like they've got nothing left in the tank. Please give them hope and give them rest. And we ask you to be the gentlest, tenderest comforter for those women whose children have died before them. It's unnatural and wrong for a parent to outlive their kids. And for many of us, the thought of our children dying is something so awful, so unbearable, that we don't even allow the question of what if to cross our minds. But for some of us, that is our reality. The person they mothered is gone, but they'll never stop being mothers. That's a pain I don't want to and can't imagine, but you are a God who stands with those who weep, and a God whose instinct is to cry with them. Your essence is compassion. And so we ask for those that in this unthinkable pain, you would be an impossible comfort. Thank you for hearing our prayers. We don't offer them just to fill time in our service or out of habit. We offer them because you tell us to bring the things that trouble us to you, and because we believe that doing so changes things. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so we pray together the collect for today. Almighty God, your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, ever lives to make intercession for us. Have pity on our weakness, and in your mercy give us those good things for which we are not worthy to ask, except through his merits, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God for ever and ever. Amen. And so we stand now to sing our offertory song before the throne of God.
Father, we give you thanks for that which we've been able to give through the bank, through cash, through our service, through our love. Take it all, Lord, we ask, and receive it and use it for your glory and for the extension of your kingdom. Amen. The Lord is here. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to praise you, Father, Lord of all creation. In your love you made us for yourself. When we turned away, you did not reject us, but came to meet us in your Son. You embraced us as your children and welcomed us to sit and eat in him. In Christ you shared our life that we might live in him and he in us. He opened his arms of love upon the cross and made for all the perfect sacrifice for sin. On the night he was betrayed at supper with his friends, he took bread. When he had given you thanks, he broke it, gave it to them and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him, his body is the bread of life. At the end of supper, taking the cup of wine, he gave you thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Father, we do this in remembrance of him. His blood is shed for all. As we proclaim his death and celebrate his rising in glory, send your Holy Spirit that this bread and this wine may be to us the body and blood of your dear Son. As we eat and drink these holy gifts, make us one in Christ our risen Lord. With your whole church throughout the world, we offer you this sacrifice of praise and lift our voices to join the eternal song of heaven. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. As Christ teaches us, we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, for we all share the one bread. And so we gather round your table with this bread of life and this cup of salvation, proclaiming the mystery of our faith. May we who share these gifts be found in Christ and Christ in us. Come, God's people, and share this meal together. So let us pray, giving thanks. God of mission, we thank you for feeding us with the bread of life and the cup of salvation. You alone bring growth to your church, and we thank you for the increase in numbers we have seen. Send your Holy Spirit to give vision to our planning, wisdom to our actions, joy to our worship, and power to our witness. Help our church to grow in numbers, in spiritual commitment to you, and in service to our local community. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Would you be seated? a footnote to that. Thanks for the growth in numbers we've seen. The, I told you that the um, newcomers' invitations went out to 21 people. And just recent list this week, Alison said to me, you know, I've put 25 people on from last year and another 20 on this year, 
and I'm going to have to pay a higher subscription on the database that we're using. And I said to her, tongue in cheek, you mean I, you want me to send some people away to avoid having to pay a higher subscription? She said, no, it's good that we're, we're breaking a barrier of, of the congregation size at which you have to pay a, a higher fee. So we give thanks to God for that. Two notices. One is Alpha course started last week, off to a good start. If you thought, oh, I've missed it, you haven't, you can join in this week, but that will be the last week. So Tuesday night, 6.30, dinner, video, discussion. Do come if you're uh, interested. If you are, please put your name on the sign-up sheet so that we know to cater for you. Second notice is the working bee. We're having a working bee next Saturday from 9 o'clock to 12 to do some work on the grounds. Um, this is particularly sparked by awareness that Uta and Fred do almost all the work and Uta's away at the moment on a cruise and when she gets back we don't want her to be faced with a lot of work and feeling she's got to start from before, work back before she, she left. But we need to anyway. There's more work than two people can reasonably be expected to do. So um, next Saturday morning, 9 o'clock, bring your gardening gear for weeding and sweeping and, um, and so forth. And at the end, at 12 o'clock, we'll have a sausage sizzle together for lunch. Um, there's a sign-up sheet, so you, we know whether you're coming or not, particularly for the sausage, sausage sizzle. If it's wet, we will delay a week to the following Saturday. OK, let's go out shouting to the Lord.
By the way, the air conditioning is working through in the hall, so that needn't stop you and indeed might encourage you to go through to morning tea, that it will be warm in there and there'll be some warm drink to warm the cockles of your heart. If you have cockles in your heart, they can be warmed. So now may the peace of God which passes all understanding keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and remain with you always. Amen. Go now to love and serve the Lord. Go in peace.